everybody, welcome to another edition of Anarchast, your home for anarchy on the internet, coming in once again from Anarcapoco in Acapulco, Mexico. And I have Alex Oyazun, did I pronounce that correctly? Or even close, halfway correct? Uh, he lives in Mexico and uh, he uh, decided to drive down about four hours to talk about uh, his book and about his thoughts on how we can have a much better and more peaceful world. And his book is called uh, the, sorry. The New Covenant. The New Covenant for, for the, the New, new Era. era. Yep. Got it, yeah. A little long, but uh, uh, looks very interesting. And we're gonna talk about things like spirituality and how we can affect, uh, help humans to get beyond uh, a lot of this control systems and uh, and to, recognize really what they are, which is uh, we have a lot of power within ourselves and w what we tend to do is give that away a lot. And a lot of this stuff goes into quite spiritual things, which I'm finding is really tied in a lot with anarchy in many ways uh, to really recognize who you are and that no other human has the right to uh, be a ruler over you. Um, so we'll get into all that. But first of all, Alex, let me ask you, how did you become an anarchist? Well, um an anarchist, I, uh, yeah, I, I believe in one ruler, which is God, which is the spirit of love on earth. And, you know, all other authority is secondary to that. So, you know, that's kind of my view on that. Um, so I guess I'm an anarchist, kind of. <laughs> well, you don't believe uh, people have the right to rule over others without their consent, right? Right. Yeah, that's yeah. an anarchist. Exactly. So. <laughs> so let's, yeah, so you're kind of new to the anarchy stuff, but you're, yeah. you really are into um, spirituality things, which you right. found my channel, and you, you felt that you wanted to talk on my channel about it. So let's yeah. talk about your book to start with, yeah. uh, The New Covenant, Covenant for the for New the Era. New era. <laughs> uh, so tell us a little bit about what the book's all about. Yeah, well, basically, uh, there's a lot of things in it, but uh, one, one of the main things is that it, it shows like a, a theory of human spiritual evolution in it. Um, and uh, well, basically what I, I believe is that, you know, we've all, a lot of people in these alternative kind of media, uh, we've seen a lot of conspiracy theories and different things about, about the dark side of things, you know, the dark world and the the mind of evil on earth, you know, and there's a lot of that nowadays. Um, and I've, I've spent most of my life trying to uh, go down the rabbit hole of, of the good side of like the light, you know, and trying to figure things out on that end, you know, and, uh, and so anyway, um, what was I going at that? Um, <laughs> well, what's the book about generally? The book. So basically it's, uh, it says that there has to be a huge transformation in, in society. And the only way to do that is to, is through unconditional love. I mean, that's basically the gist of it. Um, but, uh, there's a lot of things that I'd like to talk about. I mean, the first thing is basically there's the, the people who govern and the media and everything, um, they try and put a lot of beliefs in us and still a lot of beliefs. And, you know, one of those beliefs is that, in order to make change on, on earth, we have to uh, change, like we have to be part of government or we have to uh, be part of a, an institution or something like that people, normal everyday people can't, can't make any change on earth. And I think it's, it's exactly the opposite. I mean, I think the cause of all of this control and all of this, uh, you know, centralization on earth, basically the concentrations of power is, uh, the cause of all, all of it is us. You know, we are the cause and it's not some group or some economic system or some political system or some government or some, you know, president. Um, and that kind of empowers us. I mean, we're, we're it's kind of blaming us. But at the same time, if we want to change it, then we're empowered to change it ourselves. And we don't need to change, you know, Obama or, you know, by, cha by changing Obama or changing an economic system. I think for thousands of years we've we've tried to do that. You know, we've changed. You know, presidents. We've changed economic systems. Hey, it's it's the system. You know, let's let's change to communism now, or let's change to this, or let's change to that, or um, and none of it. It's it's kind of like it doesn't work. It's, we go back to the same old habits, and this, and everything get keeps on getting more and more concentrated, like the power in the hands of the few. And it just keeps on going and going and going and going. And so, you know, so what is the cause? It's not them because we've already tried to change them and, and 
but we're always changing oranges for oranges. I kind of look at it that way, you know, it's, it's one orange tree, it's the spirit of, of humanity that is creating this. It's not, and so if we change an orange or we cut off a branch or we, uh, you know, we, we cut off a limb of the tree, it's gonna keep on growing back into an orange because you're not getting to the root of, of what's causing all of this. And so that's like the first myth that we have to, I think we, we have to kind of shift a little bit in our, the way we, we view things, you know? Um, so that, that's kind of the first thing. Um, the second thing is, well, the theory actually kind of goes like this, um, that way back when, let's say, you know, 10,000 years ago, um, we existed as tribes in uh, ranging anywhere from 15 to, or, you know, 12 to 20 people kind of. Um, and we hunted, we, there, we were hunter gatherers. That was our economic activity. And so um, we had a self-enclosed political unit as well as social unit and no one governed over us. We were nomads and we didn't have like rulers or we, we self-governed and we just, and so as time passed, you know, what happened? We, we started gaining technology. So we started figuring things out, you know, we're like, hey, let's, let's plant this seed and just grow the, the corn or whatever, instead of going out and gathering it. So we started gaining technology and as technology increases, these social units start getting smaller and smaller. Um, and the reason for that, so, you know, as we were, we were hunter gatherers, um, and then we became uh, tied to agriculture. And then the social unit changed from this tribal unit to the family unit, um, which is smaller. And then industry came along and we went to the, from the family, the extended family to smaller families and basically to the individual unit. And so the social unit starts getting smaller and smaller and smaller. But at the same time, the political units start getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So the, the original political unit was a small tribe of 15 to 20 people. And then it became bigger townships and, you know, then it became countries and then it became, you know, New World Order or whatever, you know. <laughs> it just gets bigger and more centralized and all of that. And so that's kind of the, <clears throat> the theory of the way we've evolved as human beings. What, what, what uh, the powers that be want us, they, they only want us to see, like in history books, the only thing we ever learn is about governments and about rulers and about, you know, from, okay. from this year to this year, you know, it was this king and then came this king and then this political system. And, and, but I think the true history of how humans have changed are in that small household, you know, uh, how were we 10,000 years ago? Well, we used to live in tribes and, you know, and then how were we 1,000 years ago? Well, we were more agriculturalized and, and, and now we're more individuals, you know. We, and so basically the size of the household has gotten smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And so why? You know, the, re, the, the question is why does that happen, you know? Why, does, why do social units get smaller and smaller and why do political units get bigger and bigger? And it's one trend that is existed for 10,000 years, you know, it's like the same trend. And so the reason why, you know, ever since I was, uh, you know, younger, 15, uh, 14, you know, my mother was very spiritual and, and, uh, and she passed away. I think that had a lot to do with it. And, uh, and I always wanted to look for spiritual reality, you know, and I, I always knew that it was like, there was, there was always two forces involved, which was love and freedom. Everyone, Everyone, I've, I've always heard that it's, it's love and fear. Like everyone always says that there's only love and fear, but, but I've always seen it like love and freedom. Like, no, I don't even think fear is in the picture. It's, it's more like I want choice and I want love. Like the two things that people most want are to choose. And you can see it in, in little babies, everything, you know. You want to choose, but you also want people, you want love, you want connection, you know. So it's kind of a you know, a two-sided sword, you know, because you want to choose, but you also want people around you. And so, anyway, the way I see this theory going is that it, it's kind of like the history of, it's the story of one human being. Um, one human being, when we're babies, 
we're very subconscious, we're very dependent on our parents, we're very, uh, we don't have much choice. But as we grow older, um, we gain more consciousness and and we want to choose and we be, and we want to separate ourselves from our parents we want to have our own ident identity we want to uh and so it's basically choice is taking over that it's the spirit of choice that is taking over all the way you know we all know teenagers are very rebellious and very they want to do whatever they want to do they don't um and so we see that same force in the human history it's the same force of choice but then what happens is as we as we get as we go down further and further in our lives you know we we have a lot of choice but we want to kind of come back and we want to form our own families and so we give up some of our choice you know when you have kids everyone knows that you can't do all the choosing you know it's it's all it's sometimes about them more than you so you give up some of this choice to connect you know to love to embrace people and then as you get older and older, we become more like children. We move, get, become more and more subconscious, like old people become like kids, you know? And so it's that going and returning. Um, and I think we're still in the going stage. Like humanity is still like a, like a teenager, kind of like a just rebellious and it's, it's, it's choice. It's all about me, it's all about choice. Um, but eventually, and I think it's a time that that's becoming very self-destructive and very uh and so that same spirit that we see in the household we see in the uh in all the leaders and in all the uh you know the people whoever whoever's controlling the world i'm not sure who it is but you know a lot of people say it's freemasons or the you know whoever it is but it's that same sense of you know the me not caring about anyone else it's my control it's controlling the out the external world and so so yeah that's kind of how i see the that's kind of how my theory goes in general terms um, we can also see a uh, w there's another parallel we can we can uh, see that for example in the in the 60s everyone used to have tvs um, I mean, there, I mean, I'm sorry, there only used to be one TV per neighborhood, usually, like the rich person would buy a TV and, and so what would happen is uh, everyone would go watch TV, you know, and so that's kind of how we were in the tribe. We were very dependent upon um, each other, you know, we didn't have much choice. So, you know, if, if you went to watch TV at this person's house in your neighborhood, you couldn't say, hey, change the channel, I want to watch something else. And so you didn't have much choice on that end. And then as people, as people start um, buying their own TV sets, they start becoming, everyone just starts watching TV in their own rooms. And so that's kind of what's happened with humanity. You know, we, we were a unit without much choice. Now we have more choose, choice on a micro level, on a household level, because we're, we're not subject to cultural restraints and things like that, that we were before. We can kind of choose who we, what path we want to follow, um, what religion, you know, what, you know, what, what profession, everything. Before it wasn't like that, you know, when you were in a tribe before, you kind of did what your dad did or your mom, you know, and so now we've released, we've added more choice on a household level, but on a governmental level, we have a lot less choice. So we've been trying to become free for thousands of years. Like it's been a struggle for freedom but we can't achieve the freedom because we have more choice on a micro level, but less choice on a macro level. And so these two forces are like colliding. You know, the, the government's saying like, you gotta do this, you gotta do this. And we're like, no, we're, we're not gonna do this. And so these two forces are colliding and it's coming to a point where, you know, the macro units can't get any bigger and the, the micro units can't get any smaller. I mean, you can't get smaller than one individual, you know, in your room. So. I think it's time to, uh, to, to, to make the change, I mean, to go back. And the only way to do that, I think, is to, uh, you know, I, I follow Jesus a lot, I followed Buddha, I followed many different religions, and it, the message is very similar, is, is, to, is to give, is, is if you want to gain the world, you have to give yourself, you know, it's, it's, a, it's kind of a paradox, but it's, it's kind of the truth, you know. Um, and so that's kind of the, the gist of, 
of the of the theory, you know. Yeah, it's interesting uh, talking about how we're getting to smaller and smaller sort of social units. And you're really seeing that a lot today, especially in the Western world. You see so many people feel dis disconnected uh, and you, you see people in restaurants and everyone's just looking at their phone. And I'm not saying phones are bad. And actually, there's a great meme out there of uh, someone put a thing and everyone's on their phone. They're saying, look at how terrible this is. And then below was a picture from the 1940s and everyone on the bus was reading a newspaper. <laughs> so, so, you know, like, information is good, but I think there's, there's more connectivity needed. Uh, we've gotten so disconnected and it's been sort of a plan of these world controllers sort of types, governments and, and the central banks, to destroy the family unit, first of all, which they've been doing through central banking, uh, through the, the women's rights movement, all these sort of things that are, are uh, essentially meant to destroy the family unit. Because if they can keep us sort of just all disconnected, it's much easier to control. Uh, but if we all can see that we're all sort of one, uh, the power that we have, if we all, and I know we're never all going to realize that, but if more and more people can realize that, it can really change the world, in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah, you, you said something I totally believe in, is that we're all one. I mean, and that's one of the big uh, fallacies we've been taught, I think, is we see it in every movie, every Hollywood movie, is there's good people and bad people. And the bad people, we either have to kill them or... Uh, you know, put them in jail or, or something, you know. And, and if, if we're of the belief that we're all one, that we're all, in this, we're all in the same boat together. And this is very hard for a lot of people to, to grasp because they see a lot of evil on earth and they say, well, I don't, you know, he's not part of me, you know. I don't identify myself with him because he's, he's evil, you know, he's doing very bad things. But the more and more you delve into different people's lives and different uh, and why people are doing things um, you begin to understand that at the very core everyone is is uh, is from God I mean everyone is everyone's everyone's trying to to do what they were born and I believe what we came on earth uh, to do is to connect with other people is to, is to love basically and so yeah, I mean, that's, that's a big fallacy. If we can just get rid of that one fallacy, I think we can, we can change things. Um, but in order to do that, in order to see that an evil person has goodness in them, you really have to, uh, you, you really have, to have a sense of spirituality somehow. I mean, medit you have to go through a lot of time of self-reflection and also reflection of others. Um, and so... Yeah, that, that's one of the fallacies. The other, the other big fallacy we've, we've come to know is that, uh, like the system of justice, um, you know, in my, in my years of, uh, of, exploring, of exploring spirituality and everything, um, I, I've, I've come to know that justice, you know, the, the controller of this whole world and everything, I think is, is God. It's not all these people, it's not all these people trying to control the earth. God is like so much power, more powerful and love is so much powerful than all of these people are trying to control things on earth. And so God is a just God and God is, God is always, there's no, there's no time and no place where justice doesn't exist. And this is, this for me was like an aha moment, like a, you know, wow, like, I, like I, I, I understood that concept and it's very hard for people to I mean, I've never read that before, where, where justice always exists. Um, and so what we see is that, what is the system of justice of God? God basically, what, what is developed throughout in, in, this, in this world is that if you do harm to someone, you do it back to yourself automatically. So, so that's like just, I mean, that, there's justice in that. You know, if you harm someone, automatically you're bearing that somewhere inside of you. Um, and so for us to, you know, to go on top of that justice and say, we're going to impose our own justice on you on top of God's justice, it's just ridiculous. And so the whole system of justice, you know, of laws and putting you in jail and arresting you is just, it's not making things better. It's making no. things worse. Absolutely. I agree. Uh, putting people in cages is so medieval. <laughs> 
Especially, I could understand if it was a completely insane person who was just murdering everybody around and you had to do something. I could understand at that point, maybe putting him in some sort of a restraining area. But to put people who have not hurt anyone, which is I think uh, well over 50% of people in jail in the US, I think it's closer to 80 or 90% uh, victimless crimes. So it's not a crime because they didn't hurt anybody. Maybe they hurt themselves by doing too much crack cocaine or something, but the way to deal with that is through empathy. And you know, I've seen it myself. Um, so many of these people, there's a reason why people do things. And there's a reason why they get into really bad spots. It's because they're really hurting and they're and you see it all the time when you try to talk to like a, a homeless person who you can tell is addicted to something or something if you just sit down with them if they're of a clear enough head to talk you know openly you very quickly see they're so happy that you talk to them because no one's talked to them for so long and and then the cops come around and like whack them over the head and throw them in a cage and that just makes it worse right. and uh, it's a lot of empathy is what's needed in my opinion yeah. but here's the question though is you've sort of identified what we need to do as a human race uh, to have a better world and I, I agree generally with you but uh, do you see that happening and um, how can we help it to happen more um do i see it happening uh yeah actually i do see it happening i see a lot of uh i see a lot of extremes in both like in the darkness and in the goodness as well uh coming about um and you know i see it all the time in the street everywhere and uh there's a lot of good people out there you know there's a lot of good people out there and and we don't see that in the news and in the you know you think everyone's bad and everyone's you know and we got to fear and we got to, um, so I do think it's happening. Um, but I think we have to, uh, our beliefs are tied to, uh, it, it's all about our, what we believe in, you know, and our beliefs are tied to what we've been taught. And we've been taught um, through the institutions that teach us ethics and morality. We've been taught, for example, you know, evil people are going to hell or something. and and we got to kind of discard them. And, and so if I think there has to be a change in beliefs. I don't know how it's going to happen. I, I know it's going to happen, though, because, you know, all, all major religions have always, you know, prophesied or, or they, they've always known there's going to become a time where of, of peace, you know, where everyone, uh, you know, no government or no, there's no need for this institution to be controlling everyone. and. And so I think it's going to happen. I don't know how it's going to happen, and uh, but um, it, it's going to take a big change in in our belief system. And I think, uh, like for example, the idea that justice always exists is I don't think it's it's out there. I don't I don't think people understand that concept too well. Um, another another idea that's very controversial, but I think that it's necessary for people to to hear is that. Uh, the human rights issue, for example, in in my belief system and what I've what I've, what I've understood is that uh, we only have one human right, one God-given right, which is the right to choose to love. So, like, no one can ever take that away from you. No one, you know, if they put you in jail, if they, if they, whatever other people want to do to you, um, they can never take that choice away from you and so that that's where freedom comes from that that's where the that's where true freedom comes from because if you if you know that that that's your only human right but that's all you need to become free then then that's that's freedom and so if we can come to understand that freedom doesn't lie in in you know getting more rights from the government or getting uh getting more things or getting more uh, more of whatever you think free is or whatever you do to be free. Um, and, and we give up all those things and we concentrate on our internal world, um, then I think, I think that's where freedom lies, you know, is that, hey, I can be free without any of this stuff, you know, real, true freedom. And so, you know, I think our belief system is core to change. And I think it can happen very quickly, though. Like, like if a belief catches on in, 
if anything catches on nowadays in the internet, you know, it just kind of goes crazy. Yeah, you know? light and speed so nowadays. I think belief systems are core to the way we view the world and, and the, the change that happens in the world. So I think it can happen very quickly. Um, so yeah, that, I think that kind of answers your question. <laughs> yeah, there's a quote from the Lord of the Rings. Uh, I don't know if you've thought about the movie or the book, Lord of the Rings. Uh, it's essentially a, a talking about the ring of power and uh, how no one uh, can handle it. Uh, they, it always turns them evil. Right. Uh, even Frodo, he could barely handle it. And, um, and then look at the Hobbit and the Shire. Uh, it's all free. There was a mayor, but he didn't do anything. And they just fire off fireworks and smoke weed. And, uh, and everything was great until the Black Ring Race came in looking for the ring of power. And um, oh, I forgot where I was going to go with this story. What were you just saying? Yeah, but that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, <laughs> power. I see kind of two, you know, there's still good and evil. And, and we see what we've been, what we've been uh, indoctrinated with, the belief is survival of the fittest. You know, we all were taught that in school, you know. You know, we have to survive and that's just the way it's been for millions of years, you know. So we have survival of the fittest, which is all about the self. It's all about me and my survival. But if you take that, that same belief and once you survive, then what, what the self wants to do, the ego basically, is you want to control more. You want to take control of more and more and more. And it's never satisfied because that's not the, the nature of the soul is to connect with other people by, suppress, by letting go of the ego. And so the ego though, it's never satisfied. And so it wants to get bigger and bigger. And that's, that's kind of the ring of power. You know, once you have this power you want to get bigger and bigger and bigger and institutions are a perfect example of that. They, the objective of any institution, any, I mean, religion, re religious institution, a government, um, a corporation, you know, and any type of institution is growth. You know, shareholders are never happy with just staying the same size. They always want to get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. But there's never an end to it. They're, they're never satisfied. They're never free. You know, they're never. <laughs> so it's that ring of power that where they want to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And that's what's happening in the world. You know, go governments are getting bigger and bigger and bigger, more and more centralized. Um, but it's, there's no end to it, you know. But I think that the cause of that is our own desire to control the external world. We want, you know, there's a lot of control freaks in the world today. Yeah. You know, a lot of them because and a lot of like entitlements, you know, we're entitled to this, we're entitled to this, we're entitled to this, but, and I think that's the cause of this other, um, what's going on with the, the macro units, you know, but we can change that by letting go of that, of our ego, basically, you know, you're just letting go of that and saying, look, man, I'm gonna concentrate on being good within, and the rest is gonna take care of itself, you know? I'm, I'm gonna survive fine, I'll, I'll survive fine, you know? I, I don't have to like control everyone and, you know, um, if I'm good internally with myself and with the world, basically, then then you, you'll, do, you'll do fine. You don't need to <laughs> be a control freak and all these things, you know, so. Yeah, I remember what I was gonna say about the Lord of the Rings now, and I'm gonna butcher the quote like I always do, but Gandalf in the most recent Hobbit movie had a, a quote that I almost like clapped at the movie when I heard it. And I'm gonna butcher the quote, but it was something like, uh, evil is, uh, let me think exactly. I won't get it right, but I'll get it close to right. I said, uh, to fight evil is not uh, these big wars and all these sort of big things. I find the, the, uh, the, uh, the small things that people do every day, the small, just nice things that people do really is what creates the better world. And I guess uh, I totally butchered the quote. I'll try to find the quote. I'll put it up on the screen so you can see it's a much better quote than that. But uh, I was thinking like, uh, that's true. Uh, and a lot of people feel like they don't have a lot of power. But if you just change your life a little bit and you become more empathetic with people and more open and connected with people and get into yourself as well too and figure out who you are and it's not who you think you are usually. <laughs> like the ego is not you. Uh, it's this thing that is part of you, but it's not you. And uh, it can be your own worst enemy uh, many times. 
Uh, so that's one way to change the world, and it, it actually can happen, but it's just a question of uh, you know, how quickly uh, people catch on to these things. But as you said, the internet is changing things, and things are happening fast now. And so we could see, <laughs> things are happening so fast now that uh, it could be 10 years from now, we won't even recognize the world. It'd be so different. Right. Right. It's uh, and it could be way worse or way better, all depending on what all of us do. <laughs> yeah, it's we live in a, in strange times, you know. I mean, there's a lot of yeah, just world change on on both a macro level, like you know, with governmental level, all these uh, just there's a lot of you know, we, we wars might be going on, and and just a lot of bad things we we see that are going on in the political realm, but. But also on a household level, I think that we're changing a lot. You know, I think opening the borders, you know, the internet in one sense, in some sense, we get to know other cultures and other other forms of, you know, lifestyles and things. And we're kind of opening our eyes like, wait, you know, this isn't the only reality, you know? And so, yeah, I think, I think things can happen very quickly. Um, yeah. Yeah, the internet's interesting cause, because it ge generally is anarchy. No one really controls the internet. It's it's like a billion people around the world all contributing to it. And everyone loves the internet. I don't know anyone who hates the internet. They're like, I hate the internet. It's like, why? <laughs> uh, and that's an example of people just working together and it's wonderful. And, uh, and now the governments want to come in and try to control it because right. to protect us. Uh, so yeah, there's so much going on. It's gonna be interesting times. Um, uh, we're going to see a lot of change, and uh, it, really, we can't affect change in this world. Look at Gandhi, and he wasn't a perfect person by any means. I, I don't think any person's perfect, yeah. but uh, he defeated the British Empire by just uh, saying, uh, "No, we don't want this," uh, you know, and, and expressing uh, love. Uh, and one person defeated the British Empire. That must have been really hard for the Queen, <laughs> but uh, that was one person. Imagine if we had 50 people like that, or 100, or 500 or 500,000 people like that on the world. And it's not that hard uh, once you get more connected and, and sort of, yeah, it's, I'm still learning about all this stuff, but I know I'm on the right track. Right. And, uh, but we should wrap this up. Uh, right. But I'll, if you do have something else to say, please say it. And then uh, when you're done, let us know where people can find your book and anything else you want them to know. Okay. Um, yeah, my website is thenewcovenantforthenewera.com. Um, and, uh, yeah, just uh, shoot me an email or whatever. All my contact information's on there. Um, and basically, yeah, thanks for having me. And uh, I love Acap Acapulco. <laughs> and yeah, where do you live again? I live in Toluca. And did we start a TDV group there with you, or was that not you? I saw someone started a group there. No. Um, I might. I might start. Oh, I okay. was kind of... Yeah, that was me. Okay. Um, but I was like, well, let me go check out Mexico City first. The, the group that's oh, okay. already established there. Okay. And uh, yeah, we got to connect in that way. And and then... Uh, yeah, that's what's great about the groups is uh, it's hundreds or even maybe thousands now around the world. And they're all sort of similar like-minded and uh, very freedom oriented. Right. Uh, and uh, very uh, interesting people and also entrepreneurial, uh, which right. is great. So you can get some great business contacts. And if you want to travel around the world or move somewhere else, it's so much easier now thanks to things like this. Right. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, check out his book. I haven't checked it out myself. I'm sorry. I'm so busy. <laughs> I've literally got a, a to read and to watch list that is probably in the hundreds now. Yeah. I don't know when I'll have time to read or watch them all, but uh, I do hope to one day at some point. Uh, but uh, yeah, so um, one other thing I just wanted to mention was you said about the family. Yeah. And uh, a big thing about in the anarchist movement is uh, homeschooling and then going even further than that and doing unschooling. I don't know if you've, if you've even heard the word. But essentially, uh, you don't have any sort of format or anything. You just, kids want to learn. Right. And uh, these are the ways we can change our families. And, and when kids grow up out of the indoctrination system, right. they're so different. Yeah. And uh, they can change the world. I've met so many eight-year-old kids that uh, it's like, wow, can't yeah. believe you even exist. You're so smart. You're so connected. Uh, and uh, you got just this... Uh, energy or life to you whereas you see the yeah. kids in public school so many of them they're just beaten down every year by having yeah. to memorize stuff they don't even care about yeah and one of the that one, one of the crazy beliefs i have is uh <laughs> that i haven't told you about but uh you know as 
households get smaller and smaller and smaller, I think we're going to go back and households are going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, I think that our identity as human beings is like you're only the only true identity of yourself for me is unconditional love. Like you're not a man, you're not a woman, you're not an American, you're not, you know, a Catholic. The only thing you are in your, at your core is unconditional love because that's what God is. That's what God gave you. And so basically we're going to go, I think households are going to get bigger, but I think the marriage, like two people marrying, I think is going to go away. <laughs> I think three, four people can marry. I, I don't think there's any issues with that. From the standpoint of love, I don't think there's any issues with that. Um, and so that's very controversial, I know. <laughs> well, actually, not in our sort of anarchist sort of oh, circles. Really? There's okay. a huge polyamory movement. I don't know if you know what that is. I don't uh, really I know much about it. But yeah. at Anarchapoco this February 19th, 21st, uh, Lauren Rumpel will be there, and she's quite outspoken on that uh, love doesn't have to be just between two people. It can be with more. Exactly. Uh, and I don't see anything wrong with that either. Yeah. As long as you're not hurting anybody, I have no problem. And, exactly. And the more love on this planet, the better. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever works. Really. And the more like cooperation. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's, there's also the duality of competition versus cooperation, you know. We've been indoctrinated that cooperation is the way, I mean, competition is the way to go, you know. Me against you, who's going to win, you know. The Olympics, you know, there's one winner out of, you know, 100,000 people who want that gold medal, you know. And I think that's just, that it's the exact, exact opposite, you know. I mean, the more we cooperate with each other, um, the better off it's going to be. Not me against you, but, you know, let's do it together. Let's do something together. And, you know, that's just another, I know we're going on and on here, but. <laughs> yeah, no, very interesting. You've got a lot of interesting thoughts. So uh, yeah. I'm sure your book must be quite interesting as well. So check out his book uh, coming up in uh, February 19th, 21st is Narcopoco. And we're going to have a uh, unschooling and peaceful parenting uh, workshop there that we haven't fully announced yet, but I just wanted to bring it up because we talked about that. So we'll, be, we'll probably be announcing that in the next few weeks. And uh, yeah, that's basically it. So thanks for coming down. Right. And this has been another edition of Anarchast, your home for anarchy on the internet. Peace, love, and anarchy. So Theory of Objectivist Parenting started because, um, you know, Ayn Rand told me, if you want to be a mom one day, you, if you want to be a mom, you better like study it and make it a career, like raising children in reality, which could be an interesting subject of conversation. Um, I think it's one of the major mistakes that freedom-loving parents make. They, they raise respectful children, but they don't raise them in touch with reality. So I myself am a father of two young children, and we do kind of a combination between homeschooling and unschooling. Uh, we're actually part of a homeschooling co-op here of a lot of families getting together to kind of share the load, which I recommend heartily. It's been such a great way. Oftentimes, moms especially, who this often falls to, feel very inadequate, very overwhelmed when they say, okay, we're going to do this, now what? And uh, so it's a great way to, to share the load with other parents, to have a you know a mom who was a science major be able to offer a you know, biology class for kids or whatever. It's, it's a really great way. So that's kind of the approach that we take. From Alcapulco, Mexico, this is Anarchast.